Today I want to test a long-range 5.8 GHz Wi-Fi bridge that claims to have a 3 km maximum range, making it a great option for building-to-building -building or house-to-garage applications. If you want to see if this lives up to its performance claims, then watch the rest of this video. And if you haven't already subscribed, please do so and smash the notifications icon so you'll know when there's new content. Full disclosure before we get into reviewing this device is that they did reach out to me and send me this device for review. They had no input or influence on the video, and the contents, opinions, and test results are completely my own. They didn't sponsor this in any way, nor have they seen this video before it was published. Let's talk a bit about some use cases and go over the product and product specifications. A while ago, I had a viewer ask me about the best way to hook up an IP camera in a detached garage that was located far enough away from the house that his normal Wi-Fi wouldn't reach, and he didn't really want to run hardwire that entire distance. So I've tried the Ubiquiti version of this product, which costs a lot more. This is the first time I'm using this product, which is considerably cheaper, and I could see that under the right situation, this product could definitely fill a void. So let's get into the product specs. So if I look at the specifications that the manufacturer claims, this CPE450 wireless bridge is a 5.8 GHz long-range Wi-Fi extender. It has point-to-point -point pairing and could be done by channel select without having to access any kind of GUI, which avoids some complex setups, and we'll get into that a little bit later on. It supports point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint -point transmit and receive. The transmission speed between two bridges is the maximum is 300 megabits per second, but the highest network speed that can be achieved is 100 megabits per second. And it claims to produce smooth video regardless of how close the distance is and supports distances up to 3 kilometers, but it needs to be a line of sight for the best case scenario. In the box you get two bridge units, two 24 volt PoE adapters, two network cables, and a user manual. You're also supposed to get some clamps to allow you to mount it to poles, but for some reason mine didn't come with it. Before we get into the testing, let's cover a little bit more about the hardware. After we remove the bottom cover of the device, we can see a push button select switch, a LAN 1 Ethernet port, a channel ID LED, a LAN 2 Ethernet port, and an external power input in case you can't use PoE. And below that we see an AV selector which is used uh, for setting up a primary or receiver unit. Both the units are actually identical. The only thing that separates them from a, being a primary or secondary is that switch. If we look at the outside of the unit, we can see some status LEDs that show up if there's power, LAN 1, LAN 2, and the signal level, which is helpful when you're setting these up. Before you power up, make sure that the device is set to A for the primary, and that the secondary unit that you want to use that's going to be located out in the field or wherever you're going to put it is set to B. You want to plug your LAN 1 port into the switch into your switcher router. When you plug the adapter, the device will power up and it'll power up on the default channel. Do the same thing to the secondary unit and make sure they're both set to the same channel and that your secondary unit is set to position B. You can use the LAN port 1 on the secondary device and plug that into the device that you want to communicate with, like a camera, laptop, whatever it's going to be. The important thing here is that both units show the same channel. You can try different channels to get the best performance, just make sure they're the same. The next step isn't really required to get things working, however it's really good security practice. You need to change the default password which is, comes out of the box set to admin. It's not mentioned in their documentation anywhere, but to me it's a really critical part of setting up your device or any device for that matter. To change the default password on these, it's, it's necessary, but it's not really it's very straightforward, and you got to jump through a few hoops. It's not a whole lot different than many other network devices, so we'll walk through it step by step. To get to the GUI, we have to hook up each device to your computer or laptop directly. We're going to start with the primary device first. In order for it to actually communicate, though, you have to first open up your network properties and change your adapter from DHCP to manual. In the manual IP settings, type 192.168.255.15 or any two-digit number at the end, it's probably not going to matter. Just don't use anything above 100. 
for the DNS and gateway settings, you use the 192.168.255.1. And this is covered in the documentation. We're just walking through it. Once you've got these settings, you can save it. And you should now be able to go to your browser and type the IP of the channel that you're using. And this is where it got a little bit confusing. If we look at the chart, you'll see an IP address for both the primary and secondary device. So if you've set your channel, for example, to channel 3 as I did, then you have to look at the chart and use the corresponding IP address. So in my case, since I use channel 3, uh, I need to type 192.168.255.103 for the primary unit and that should load up the web interface. Conversely, I do the same thing to the secondary unit, except I use a .203, and this is all covered in the chart. Just remember that if you used a different channel number, like one or four or whatever you used, you need to look at the chart to see which uh, fixed IP that you're supposed to type into the browser. So once you get it typed in, it's gonna take you to the main screen and to log in as admin admin. Once you're in there, there's two things that you got to change. One is really important. That's, of course, the default password. And there's not really a mention of this in the documentation. The second thing is not a huge deal, but I just feel better changing it. And it probably has some interaction inside somewhere. And that's to change the region that you're in. It may impact total power or frequency that's put out. Once you do these two items, you can save and exit out. Do the same thing to the other unit. And then, of course, don't forget to set back your DHCP settings back to automatic when you're done. Because this is a one-time shot. Unless you plan on doing some more configurations. Now that we have everything configured and working, it's time to test this thing out. I can't test their full claims of three kilometers. As I live in a hillside community, and the longest line of sight from my house is about 0.2 kilometers, which is about 0.13 miles significantly more than you can get out of a standard Wi-Fi access point, but nowhere near the maximum of their claims. That said, if I can get full speed at that distance, at least it tells me it can go farther. I installed a primary bridge in, at my house and drove the secondary unit as far as I could up the street. I powered the secondary device using the 120 volt output power in my SUV and I used the laptop to actually do the testing. I ran this test from the front of my house to as far up the street as I could go. And as you can see from the speed test, it's coming pretty close to maxing out the maximum rated speed for this device. Keep in mind that I didn't do any tuning or optimization and basically just ran it out of the box. I also ran iPerf just to see how it would do, even though iPerf does tend to read on the low side, especially over wireless where there's a bit of latency. Overall, for the cost and given use case of this product, it works pretty well. If you're trying to stream a single camera or media device across the longer distance, then this product should work well for you. In my testing, the connection was always stable and consistent, but of course you're limited to the 100 megabit bandwidth. If you need internet access in a distant garage or building, and the use case is pretty low bandwidth, then this is a cost-effective solution. You could team this up with a low-cost switch and it would really solve a problem. That's about it for today's video, and I want to give a special thanks to them for sending me this product to review. I'll leave some affiliate links below if you're interested in more information on this product. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe and smash that like button if you found this useful. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.